Welcome to Business in the Age of Empathy. Today we're talking with Maria Eisner Belch, who is building sustainable solutions for the future economy at Concordium in her role as Senior Business Solutions Manager. In the past, she's led implementation of technologies at IBM and holds a Master of Innovation and Business Development from Copenhagen Business School, Denmark. Concordium, also based in Denmark, is a science-based blockchain using zero-knowledge proofs designed to have real-world utility and specifically benefit business applications. If you don't know exactly what that means, that's quite all right. Maria is going to take the time with us to explain to us what that actually means and how it benefits sustainability. Welcome to the podcast, Maria. Thank you so much, Chad. I'm very excited for the conversation we're having because we're going to talk about something that I'm also pretty passionate about but don't know a lot about, which is technology and blockchain technology. I'm really excited as well to be here. So how did you end up at Cocodium? Well, I've always been really curious about tech and especially like bleeding edge tech. I started my career working with AI and I normally say it was at the time where no one really knew what to do with AI, but I'm sure a lot of people did. But at that time I was working, oh, 2016, I was working at IBM and they made this innovation center that was focusing on building applications, leveraging AI or Watson at that time for corporates. And then I moved to a think tank and I worked with all of these different technologies and how they can help us solve the climate challenge. That was always a big focus for me. But then I kept finding myself being in meetings where I couldn't explain blockchain, like the core elements of having something that is decentralized, like the Mm -hmm. massive importance of having something where not one institution or government actually owns and can influence a system. I didn't really fundamentally understand how significant that was. So I just kept finding myself in these meetings going like smart contracts, blockchain, and then having no clue. (laughs) So I took... (laughs) But you did have a sense of the importance of it, right? At that time. Absolutely. Why? I think I've never seen a technology more potent to solve problems at a systemic point. I really see blockchain as an infrastructure fundamental way of changing, for instance, how we distribute wealth or when we create business models. And I was really curious to learn more. So I took a course at INSEAD and I just got completely sold. Do you remember that moment where it clicked? This is going to be so nerdy. It was (laughs) when I, because when I took the course, they really explained like how are the next blocks in a blockchain build? Why do we do it this way? And that was when I fundamentally understood why that technology is so different from some of the other technologies that we have. You were already very much interested in technology, very much interested in blockchain for climate change. And how did you end up at Concordium? Concordium has an office here and our founder, Lars, is a man that I've always had a lot of respect for. So it was quite natural for me when I was done with my degree in a blockchain course I took that Concordium was the right place for me. I had a conversation with the CEO and my boss now, and I remember they were like, oh, we think ESG is really interesting, and we're looking into something with ships and e-fuel, but really, if you want, you can come and build whatever you want. And to someone who loves solving difficult issues like the climate and using tech for it, I was like, this is a match made in heaven. Yeah, this was your dream job. They were just saying, come in and do everything you want. They're like, you know what? Come in. We're sure it's going to be huge because Concordium is very focused on enterprises as well. And obviously with all of the regulations coming in from next year on, it is going to be a huge focus. And to me, I've already seen that having something that no one owns that is transparent is what you need if you want to solve a global problem. You can't use a centralized solution for it. It has to be decentralized. No one can own the solution for it. No one can own the data that proves it. It has to fundamentally be decentralized. Amazing. So we'll get into why Decentral is so important and we'll get into some of the solutions that you're working on. But before we get into that, can you explain to us what it is that Concordium does? 
Yes, absolutely, I can. Concordium is what we would call a layer one blockchain. It's similar to Ethereum and Bitcoin. It's just a different way of executing smart contracts. But essentially what my company does is we're a nonprofit. So we are here to help grow the Concordium ecosystem and make sure that any application or any company building something on the Concordium blockchain, that they thrive and have the right resources they need and the right infrastructure to make safe solutions for people to use. So when you say layer one, what does that mean? Layer one blockchain technology? A layer one is like an operating system of a phone. So you can either have Android or you can have iOS. So essentially Concordium is an operating system for doing Web3 applications. And in the same way as Apple would have people working on making that whole infrastructure and development kit really sexy and smooth for developers, that's what we do at Concordium as well. What is the need that Concordium is meeting as opposed to other existing layer one blockchains? When Lars Saya, who founded Concordium, he was the co-founder of Saxo Bank, who was one of the first companies to do tradings on the internet. And when he started getting into the space of Bitcoin and Ethereum at that time, you were able to be completely anonymous. And with his knowledge from traditional finance, he didn't see it as an infrastructure that could actually have institutional adoption or have the average Joe come onto the platform because you were still able to be completely anonymous. So where Concordium differs is that you need to have an ID uploaded so we know that it's a real person behind it. That doesn't mean that we would know who you are. You still get to be insanely private. But in our view, you have to have trust. And trust comes, in our view, with knowing there's an actual person on the backside of it. It caters to this institutional need from businesses and regulators to know that the people they are dealing with on the blockchain are real people. Exactly. And that's what's needed to drive adoption. In our view, it most certainly is. So can you... Take us a bit through why decentralized is so different. There's two sides to it. So one of them is we've been growing up with putting trust into governments and decentralized bodies and whatever they say is the truth, but we don't have access to the actual data. Specifically within tech, having these tech giants that we use to lock into everything. They know everything about us, right? They have all of the data lined up and it's all kept in this centralized instance where they know more about me than I know about myself, which is to me insane. And I think we're slowly figuring out as technology is becoming more prevalent in our lives that some of those data points are wrong. And I think that's where the point of doing something that is in a Web3 space where things are decentralized, they're transparent, you know, who has your information, you can easily withdraw those claims and you always know what has been written to a blockchain. That just fundamentally changes the way you can build business models. So you've just very shortly outlined the three main benefits of blockchain. It's decentral, that it's transparent and that it's immutable. But can you also explain why and how blockchain makes this possible? When we explain blockchain technology, a lot of the times we go so deeply technical in how the next block is made that we forget the applications you can build. Like if I were to explain to you the Apple infrastructure, you would be like, I don't get this or I do get it a little bit, but I can't imagine what you can build, which is why I normally stick to the words of decentralization. It's a network that is operated by many, so there's no single point of failure. It's immutable because you can't, on some blockchains, you can roll it back. But on most of them, it's when you write something to the chain, it's there for good. That means you can go back in five years time and look at, was that really written to chain at that point? You say, so my university certificate, for instance, could be something that you would write to a blockchain. And then whenever I send it to an employee, he can verify that document is real and that certificate is real. So let's switch on over to talking about some actual projects and interesting things that you've been looking into. We've been looking quite a lot into something called regenerative finance. Obviously, any huge effort needs a banging title. <laughs> so within the blockchain space, we have what is called regenerative finance. And it's really a movement to use blockchain and Web3 to address anything climate change related. So that can be supporting 
conservation or biodiversity with these carbon markets that have been a huge focus, or it can be creating new, different, sustainable financial systems. So one of those examples is, for instance, aid and donations, where crypto has really made a difference for a lot of the disasters that we've seen in the world. So one thing is the war in Ukraine, where crypto donations was a big part of getting funding to the country. Immediately, the latest one is obviously the earthquake in Turkey and Syria, where I think within two weeks, or so they got more than 12.5 million donated through cryptocurrencies. The fact that you can so easily transfer money within seconds to an area that actually needs it with people on the ground who know how to distribute it in the best ways possible is a really powerful application of the technology. Yeah, there's also a point where at least in the Netherlands and I think Denmark as well, we have to make a perspective shift because sending money to another Dutch account is like seconds and it costs nothing. But for most of the world, it's a very different reality. And especially in a disaster stricken country like Turkey at this moment. Well, on the one side, we have the fact that we can make it more effective by not having to send the money to one organization who then has to distribute it again. But then there's also this 100% transparency thing, which is, I think, very attractive. Yeah, so I mean, what's possible with cryptocurrency is that obviously you can track them throughout the system. So you can trace what they're being used for, which is something that makes sense, I think, personally, for direct aid and donations. So you could imagine a future where, for instance, in a crisis, you could go in and in a supermarket, you could buy the entire shelf of diapers and they would just be free for anyone who wanted or needed diapers or needed baby food or whatever was a top priority to you makes it more human like donating 10 50 100 thousand euros it's money but donating diapers you get a sense of what it is that you are helping someone with it makes it more real exactly and at the same time you know where it ends up right you know who on all blockchains you want but you would know who owns the final wallet so if that is a donation specific wallet you would know that goes to that specific account again we're moving from a world where we've been blindly trusting to actually now being able to have the evidence for it. And most of the times we've been blindly trusting with no issues at all. But other times, you know, donations end up in places they shouldn't end up in. So I think it's a really interesting way of leveraging a technology that was first meant to send and wire money that now supports a lot of different business models. Amazing. And there's also been different applications you've been looking at, like the cleaning up the ocean one, right? Yeah, so I am personally quite fund of anything with the oceans. I'm a terrible swimmer, but Same. I think <laughs> um, there are a lot of very interesting applications of blockchain technology for the oceans. So one is an ocean cleanup project where you use blockchain technology to track the data of the plastic collection points. So imagine someone in Indonesia is out on the open water they're collecting plastic, they're taking a picture of it, it gets geotagged, it goes on a blockchain. And then you take it back to the shore, it gets measured. Again, that data point is verified on a blockchain. A guy comes to collect it, they sort out the ocean plastic that is useful, and a payment is made to that individual. And that could either be in monetary terms, or it could be in something that is exchangeable, for instance, for rice or whatever is needed in that given specific community. And who is funding that process? the companies that are doing the plastic pollution. So you start creating this closed loop circle where instead of Coca-Cola going out and saying, hey, we're doing ocean cleanup, they can actually say, hey, we did ocean cleanup and here are all of the timestamps, verified data points of where we did it, how we did it. And then obviously if that was built on Concordium, the beautiful part would be that you would know that it's an actual human behind because we have identity. You would also be able to set in parameters of that person can't be under the age of 16 because you would want them to be in school. So you can start differentiating who is actually allowed to participate in this kind of economy. So it's monetizing, cleaning up. Yeah, and I think that's why I think this technology is insane is that it actually helps us change things systemically because it has the monetary systems built into it as well. The financing goes back to the people actually doing the difference and not into a huge institution that then has to distribute. and Exactly. You kind of write your brain to imagine not needing a 
financial person who is deciding who can get the money, who cannot, how do we do all these logistics? It just happens automatically once specific parameters have been met. Exactly. I think my favorite case is on carbon markets. So before we get into that, I want to say one thing, because I think it also reflects on the carbon offsetting thing. There's also maybe a danger a plastic manufacturer could get the sense that innovating further or using less plastic is no longer necessary because we're getting the plastic cleaned out of the oceans. I think that's such a valid point. I would love to get into that conversation. Let's do it. Good. All right. The whole purpose of doing anything sustainability related and actually doing better for the climate is not just to close your eyes and pay your way out of it. And one of the narratives that we set up to solve the climate crisis is you need to reduce and then what you can't reduce, you need to offset. And until we get to a place where you can actually reduce the 90% that you need to reduce, those offsets are going to be quite a big piece of that pie for a lot of corporations and also individuals who want to offset. And I think coming from a world where we've been so attuned to maximize everything and then forcing a reduction mindset leaves us as human beings and individuals quite unimaginative. Like we imagine just going around and then cutting things off, right? Slicing them down, doing less. It doesn't really leave that space to be insanely creative and rethink and reimagine. It just leaves us with cutting down. And obviously I think a lot needs to happen in the top part. Instead of just reducing, we need to fundamentally reimagine materials, supply chains, distribution, consumption, and blockchain can help with creating transparency in a system. But you still need a narrative that is intriguing enough for people to actually lend their creativity. So with all of this in mind, how was it for you to start working on the carbon offset market? When they gave me the responsibility of sitting with this area, the offset market was something that I really didn't want to take part in. Because? The traditional offset market is just so opaque. There's really no transparency, right? You go in on a website and you see a picture of a forest and it's the same picture on 90 different websites. And I have no data point, no access to knowing what I'm actually buying, right? When I'm on a website and I see that carbon offsetting, I just feel like responsibility being shoved off to me. Why am I the one paying for this or choosing to pay for this? I don't mind paying more for a company that is sustainable, but it just feels weird, right? When a company like KLM asks me to pay extra money to offset their carbon footprint, it's just weird to me. And of course, <laughs> you don't know, you have no idea what they're going to do. You have no do. idea what, how, what, what are they financing? Where does the money go? And I. But I'm sure at Concordium, you're trying to do it differently, right? What we want to help grow in the Concordium ecosystem is projects that are doing it fundamentally different, where you actually, as a consumer or a corporate, you get access to the data. You know that when the scanning was, it was timestamped on a blockchain, who did the verification with credentials. You know that there's not more than those certificates that were being sold because otherwise it would be evident on the chain. So there's no double counting anymore. And then most importantly, you know that once you trigger and press buy, 50% will go straight into the wallet of the people who own that land. And for this specific project, it's the indigenous people in Canada for some of the land, and they get 50% of that. So again, you're financing doing more and doing better, which to me is a really good way of changing a market that has been very opaque and non-transparent. Do you have partners who have jumped on this way of doing carbon offsetting? There's a lot of other projects as well in the space that are doing really cool stuff, but they have, I think before the project even launched, 60% of their offtake, so the credits were actually purchased uphand because it made such a big difference. A lot of companies now with their net zero targets, they need to prove it. And to prove it, well, you need data that you can trust, and that's not a spreadsheet anymore. It just It's not going to cut it anymore. You need the actual data points from the specific sources rather than something you say yourself. Yeah, amazing. I haven't actually read up on this, but I do have the idea that indigenous people are very much working on preserving nature and biodiversity just because it's their 
livelihood in their homes. And this is one of those examples where blockchain makes it possible for the work they are doing to be actually, yeah, once again, monetized may feel a bit financial, but it is rewarded. being monetized. Rewarded, yeah. But reason why, yeah, rewarded in the sense that actually allows them to gain more traction and do more with it and being entered into the narrative instead of being this faraway thing that happens or doesn't happen or we can donate to or can't. Exactly. It gets the offsetting a bit closer to you. Yeah. So thinking about how blockchain can change the world, what other things spring to mind? If you have this future vision that you could draw out, what do you think blockchain will do in the next coming decade, two decades? Hopefully a lot of built-in trust and financing going to the right places. Essentially what a blockchain does is it cuts out intermediaries, taking a cut on each step of the process. And if you cut that out, there's a lot of leftover wealth that can be distributed to the right places. And we're going to have to see how many changes that will unlock in the world. Yeah, I'm thinking a lot of them will come from the fringes and from the communities actually making a difference. So rather than having, I don't know, the world's largest forest manager doing credits, you will probably see that it's a guy who owns one or two acres that is doing his very best to take care of the biodiversity and then doing impact certificates that way around. Let's wrap it up. I want to thank you very Yay. much, Maria. It was a very interesting conversation. Thank you so much for having me on. We hope that we have inspired you into action for a regenerative future. This is by no means the easy way of doing business. But the way we see it, it is the only way. To join us in creating a more regenerative world, please visit our website on innateemotion.com or follow us on Instagram or LinkedIn.